She has been introduced uh, several times this past week, and I thought that I'm going to do her introduction a bit differently. And um, I want to in invite you to, in, to sort of listen into our conversation. It's kind of a one-sided conversation. I'm not expecting an answer from you, okay? What I want to do is to reflect, and I hope I'll be echoing your own compliments on the gracious ministry this lady has had in our midst this evening. So, here goes. I began by saying that one couldn't ask for a more pleasant task this evening after a busy week of long days, busy ones, but yet very delightful. And so I want us to join me in complimenting her for two things basically. Number one, for directly fulfilling her commitment to deliver lectures for the Simpson series this year. But I, <laughs> and I have seven reasons <laughs> why we should give her another applause when I'm through. The first one is, Dr. Donna, we want to thank you for having contributed to our lives during this week indirectly through your personality. Amen. Please accept these compliments as a genuine tribute for allowing God to use you beyond the lectures. Thank you for teaching us to exhibit a delightful and infectious love for God our Father Amen. through the Son and in the power of the Spirit. Pretty Trinitarian, isn't it? <laughs> you taught us to laugh. To come to do serious business for God, but to have fun doing it. Thank you. Thank you for demonstrating the thrill and excitement of love. Being loved and loving in return. This evening, today the 10th day of February 2010. Marva and Myron are celebrating the 248th lunar anniversary. <laughs> Congratulations. Now, I believe that is very romantic because she did say to me that, uh, to us at the class, these are insights from the, the, the kind of person she was, and we're delighted to the fact of the fact that uh, she can share her personal life with us to that degree. Very transparent and humble. But she and her husband they don't celebrate an anniversary. Every month on the day of their marriage, they celebrate. I think that's pretty romantic. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that with us. Matter of fact, she encouraged me to share that with us. Thirdly, thank you for being so gracious shown in your winsome and friendly engagement in both delightful and difficult conversations in the talkback sessions, for untiringly expressing your gratitude for those who provided care, support, and hospitality. Your all-embracing smile made it a delightful task to do for you. Thank you for being a living parable for this evening's topic. Your sermon in chapel this morning reminds us of what God is looking for in our preaching. It demonstrates that preaching principle of truth through personality. Thank you very much. For those of us who are veteran preachers and budding preachers, I trust that it has been very effectual for us. And finally, thank you for being a living sacrifice in so many ways. And you have enriched our lives, our faith journey, and our community here in Nova Scotia. And I can assure you, you're always welcome to return among us. May, let us thank her for being the kind of person she was among us. Our prayer is that God may anoint you this evening with an extra measure of grace to complete the task that you have begun and that it might be for all of us one mem memorable Simpson series that will be etched in our minds for years to come. Just before I pray for Dr. Dawn as she brings her evening lecture, please remember to fill in the evaluation forms and return them at the desk before you leave. Thank you. Let us pray.
Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and in the power of your Holy Spirit, grant your anointing on your servant. Give her the liberty of this podium this evening. Give her the clarity of speech, the insightfulness of the wisdom that comes only from you, and grant us hearing ears and receptive hearts to your glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. It's much easier to make the transfer onto crutches when it's not on ice. <laughs> as much as I love this countryside, I don't, and I would love to live here, I don't think I could handle your winters. It has been a sheer delight for me to be here, and I am very grateful for the privilege. Thank you so much for letting me come. Um, Tonight, as we laid out the program, after we heard some of the reasons why um, our worship is not as it should be, and we recognize what God has asked us for in worship, tonight I do want to talk about what God wants from the preachers in worship. And this is not to condemn anybody, this is just to encourage you and to um, help us recognize that we really hold an amazing heritage and that God calls us to be faithful, and there is no greater joy. So um, let's begin with the usual beginnings. And during this time of silence tonight, especially think about, well, I should say it this way. Um, especially think about, especially think about millennial agnostics. I called this whole series... Um, worship in an age of weary skeptics and millennial agnostics. I'm really so worried about the younger generation in our society. They are so lost, and they, they want to reject religion because that's what their peers do, and yet they have nowhere else to turn. And they are so lost because they have no absolutes since they're postmodern, and they've been trained in that, and they look everywhere for some kind of help but not to Christianity because Christianity is mocked in the culture. And so how important it is for us to raise our children to recognize the love of God and to raise our children to be evangelists um, so that they can talk to their peers and invite them to come to know the love of God too. You're so spread out tonight. It's hard to see you all. There, that's a better view. <laughs> Let's begin with the usual, okay? Moment of silence, the ancient greeting, and I'll pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for the wonder of this community and their wonderful welcome as they have greeted me every night with enthusiasm and I feel very empowered to teach and wonderfully aware of your presence. I'm especially grateful also for that baby's cry because as it as it gurgles in delight or whatever is behind its making noises, it just reminds us that we are your children, that you have endowed us all with the blessings of your grace and that you call for us to be children so that we receive your grace in fullest measure and don't get in the way. Thank you so much for the joy of the gospel and may that joy thrill us tonight as we study your word, that as we look to you, we might know you more deeply 
and know more deeply how you call us to be your servants so that we might serve you more effectively for the sake of the many people in our culture who do not know you yet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's think about that joy of the gospel as we listen to this text, which is our text for tonight. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And I am confident that that one Oh, you know what? I started on the wrong text. Sorry. Can we start over? Yeah. Block off that from the tape. I don't know why I started on the wrong text. Well, I've... Never mind. Things were a little bit too frenzied today, and I didn't, I didn't sit in calmness before the text just before beginning. So please forgive me for that faux pas. You know, most places I can't say that. They don't know how to pronounce faux pas. <laughs> but you all do since you're Canadian. Anyway, I solemnly charge you in the name of, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And in light of his appearing and his, his kingdom. Preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all gentleness and long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when people will no longer endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate teachers for themselves in accordance with their own desires, who on the one hand turn aside from truth and on the other hand, turn their ears aside from the truth, and on the other hand, turn toward myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the not very well proclaimed word of God. I don't know why I lost it. I am, please forgive me. I, want, I think it's because I was sort of thinking about the canonical heritage of this text. Do you know about canonical interpretation? In ca canonical reading of the text? This is an understanding of reading the scriptures as the church passed them on. What I love about it is it takes us away from arguments. And it was those arguments that I was sort of thinking about today. Everybody in the academic circles argues over whether Paul could have written Timothy. And most modern scholars and postmodern scholars say he couldn't have because Timothy has much later language and it wouldn't have been possible for Paul. Those that want to stick to the tradition of the church say, yes, Paul wrote it, and they ignore what evidences there are to the contrary. Rather than fight about it, what the canonical interpretation does is say, this is the way the text was passed on by the church, so what are the advantages for our interpretation if we hear it this way? Isn't that wonderful? So we can say, this is the canonical Paul who wrote it. That means, I don't know whether it was Paul or not. I'll find out when I get there. And in the meanwhile, we can think about the advantages of, thinking, of reflecting on Paul as the writer because if this really was Paul the aged apostle before his death writing to Timothy, knowing that he's going to be um, punished by Rome and knowing that he probably will die, 
sort of giving his last will and testament to Timothy. So there are many advantages to interpretation. Don't you agree? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. So I will, from now on, simply refer to Paul rather than saying the canonical Paul. But in, in case that troubles you, you can just insert the word canonical. Okay? Yes. That's one of the great advantages when you're trying to build bridges between various scholars so that we can hear the gospel more clearly. And why I chose this text is because it begins with, I solemnly charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the death, and by his appearing, which is actually the word epiphany, and by his kingdom, which is, the, which is it actually epiphania, and basileia, the kingdom. So in light of that understanding of God, and we think about those three things, it's a nice proportion. There's, a, there's warning, there's judgment, so there's law, and it stirs up a hunger for gospel. Now whether or not we hear his coming as gospel depends upon how we know him. And since we know him as the revealer of the grace of God, and by the power of the Spirit, we receive that grace and are imbued with that grace, welcomed into the family of God by that grace. Therefore, we hear the word, his epiphania, as coming in all this wonderful grace. And we also hear the word kingdom as the name of the saints, the saints who inhabit God's kingdom already and those of us that are waiting till we can inhabit it too. That's one of the reasons why I love the book of Revelation. I, I don't suppose it's your favorite book, huh? And I've not met very many people for whom it is a favorite book. But I taught it one year for a group of um, uh, Christians from all denominations. And um, this group included both men and women. And they were very surprised that I picked Revelation. But I had had an intersusception the summer before. I was leading a camp out in the mountains. And all of a sudden, I felt this terrible pain in my stomach. And I said, we've got to go to a hospital. And, and we were driving down the mountain. And there was a little clinic there. And they said, can we stop here? Just then a shaft of pain went through me like I cannot believe. And I said, no, we can't stop here. We need a major hospital. I didn't know why. I didn't know what was going on. Got down to the hospital. They couldn't figure out all day long. And they admitted me, writing on my admittance form, patient looks much older than her age. <laughs> so I knew that was something serious. <laughs> anyway, at midnight, the doctor came into my room. And thank God, he was a Christian. He came into my room and he said, um, I want to pray with you because I've got to go in. There is something deathly wrong with you. And we've got to find out what it is. Well, they turned, they turned uh, I mean, we prayed, and they did cut me open, and they found that my intestine had intersuscepted across itself. That usually happens only in babies. It happened in me as an adult. Two weeks later, I was reading a book by Charles Williams and found out he died of it. So um, I'm glad I didn't know that when he told me that's what it was. But anyway, my intestine folded over on itself, and 10 inches was gangrene. They said I never would have lived till morning, that it's a good thing he went in at midnight. And they cut 10 inches out of me. You see, I'm shorter. <laughs> but in that experience, when I was in the hospital recovering from that interception, and when I had to not do any exercise because I'd pretty well been destroyed in my middle, um, they, and I had to stay down and couldn't do much, I read the book of Revelation. And I found it vastly comforting. And I learned that you can summarize the whole book of Revelation in three sentences. Every part of Revelation is one of these three sentences. Number one, God is Lord. Not Caesar, who claims he's Lord, and who's making all the Christians claim he's Lord too. Otherwise, they get persecuted. And this book is written for those who are persecuted. Number two, Satan wants to be Lord. And keeps pretending he is. But number one is stronger than number two. So number three, hang in there, baby. <laughs> Everything in Revelation is one of those three. 
Really. Every part is either describing the lordship of Jesus Christ or showing the dominion of Satan. For example, in chapters 12 to 14, where it shows how Satan imitates the Trinity in the dragon and two beasts. Just read that section and you'll see all these parallels between the Trinity and Satan's imitations. Or, number three, it's a word of comfort for the early church to hang in there because the early church was being persecuted in so many different ways. Now, why did I get on the book of Revelation? Oh, yes, to talk about the importance of learning to read the scriptures canonically. Because the scriptures say that it was written, Revelation was written by John. And we want to think that it's the gospel writer John. And all the modern scholars say it couldn't have been because Revelation was written at the turn of the century. And so when we read Revelation canonically, we can read it that it's from John, the beloved disciple who knew Jesus best. And in knowing Jesus best, would be able to understand the importance of comforting Jesus' church when it was under severe persecution. Yeah? That was a bit of a sidetrack. So now, I solemnly charge you, in the presence of God and the presence of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead. That warning of judgment is necessary because we need again to face the law. The fact is, we all deserve the judgment. And when we think about how much we deserve it, it changes our attitude toward how great it is to be saved. We just can't take it for granted. We just can't think that it's pretty ordinary that Jesus Christ has come into our lives and killed ourselves. It's great because ourselves get so much in the way, our broken, sinful selves. I'm not talking about our redeemed selves, which are very important for the gifts with which God has equipped us and the ways in which we can serve God. But ourselves as broken and sinful, we want to get rid of, eh? Yes. You always respond better when I say eh. <laughs> so, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. This proportion, then, is very good because he not only judges the living and the dead, but his coming again is a cause for great rejoicing. I can't wait till he comes again. Another handicapped friend of mine and I have a, have a challenge that when we get to heaven, we're going to race up Mount Rainier. Everybody says, when you get to heaven, you could probably fly up Mount Rainier. We say, we don't want to fly. We want to run because we can't do it now. And we're going to have a race. And oh, man, that's going to be so joyful. We're not going to have any handicaps anymore. That is going to be such a great experience to have whole bodies I mean, I hope you have some reason like that to greatly rejoice in the prospect of heaven and his coming. Yes? And his kingdom. But we don't have to wait till heaven to experience the kingdom. And that's what's so good about this Trinitarian. I say Trinitarian because whenever the Bible wants to emphasize something that's deity, it groups it in threes. Even in the First Testament, where three becomes the sacred number for the divine, even before they knew about Trinity. Isn't that miraculous? Think about it. Even, an example, the book of Isaiah, when it says, the, the Lord, the mighty one of Israel, you're a savior. Why do we list three names? Because three is the divine number. Yes? Yeah. Just thought you ought to know that too, since you already know seven. Which, of course, I would have for points tonight, but I don't. Think about judging, appearing, and kingdom in contrast to each other. And for our sakes, appearing and kingdom are gospel terms. Judging is law, what once we, but once we've been through it, it's no longer law to us. It's law for us because we are judged in our sinful state. And we dare not take for granted that we've been delivered from that, that needs to always come to us fresh. That's why it's every once in a while good for us to have serious bouts of doubting our call 
or doubting our salvation or doubting things important about God. Because when we go through those troughs in our spiritual life, we come again into the joy of our salvation. And too easily in our daily life, we just treat that as rather humdrum, don't we? Or am I the only sinner in this crowd? We oftentimes turn away from how great it is that we are part of God's kingdom. And I don't think we should so that we retain the joy of it and demonstrate that to the world. Because the world is asking, should I pay attention to Christianity or not, since there's so much mockery. And if we are vibrant, gay Christians, and I don't mean that in the, in the new meaning of that word, I mean it in the original meaning, which I hate to lose, have it stolen from me. We are Christians filled with gladness. And to demonstrate that gladness to the world is one way we're going to attract the world to Jesus Christ. Worship is not the attraction, but we are. Throughout the scriptures, it says that we're the ones that are witnesses. And that's why I stress this so much. And in an age when so many skeptics are weary, they're tired of their own constant questioning. And so millennials, so many millennials are really lost because their parents have not shown them the joy of Christianity. They need somewhere to see it. And it might be you. It might be in your hospitality. It might be in the way you mentor them. It might be in the way you take them under their wing. It might be in multitudes of ways, according to your spiritual gifts. But oh, how the millennial generation needs you. And I hope that you'll talk to them more when you see them in worship. But I've heard a lot of people say, I'm scared of talking to young people. They're just so cynical. Well, you know what? The young people are scared to death of you. That's why they're cynical. It's how they hide. And if we realize that they're hiding under that potent cynicism, we start to realize they are so lonely and so lost and so hungry for mentoring. That's the thing I hear from them the most. They talk to me a lot. And when I talk to young people, I just have a whole lot of fun with them because I love to do those anything you ever wanted to ask a theologian but never had a friendly one around. And they really get into those because they've got lots of spiritual questions. And I have such fun doing them with them that we get to be friends. And you know what they always tell me? The reason they don't like coming to worship? You know what they tell me? They never say it's the style of worship. Never. When you talk to them seriously, what they always say is, nobody cares that I'm there. Do you hear what I hear in that? A hunger for relationship. And that is multiplied by our tech society. I wanted to talk about that more at length on Monday night, but I'd already gone over time. But tech society eliminates the possibility of intimacy. There are kids who can email each other, but they can't talk face to face. And I have never yet met an email that was intimate. Intimacy needs to be touched and spoken eye to eye and experienced. It can't be sent mechanically, technologically. So in that loneliness of young people, they need desperately for you to care that they're there in worship. And I dare you, if you start talking with the young people more, you'll see them respond with greater attendance in worship. One congregation tried that. It was because of the great pastor. This pastor went to the elders meeting and the pastor said he held up pictures of all the kids in confirmation class and there were 34 kids in that year's confirmation class. Guess how many the church council knew? Three. Three. Their own kids. Three out of 34. So the pastor started a project. Every week he would assign a new couple to a young person. And the, the greatest comfort was the, the first couple who tried. And I don't remember what their names were, so we'll just make it up and call them Oli and Olga. 
because I'm usually with German crowds and Swedish crowds and so forth and so forth. You probably haven't got any heritage in Sweden and Germany, do you? Any of you? Some of you have in Germany? Well, anyway, we'll, can I call them Olga and Oli? This couple, they, they were very shy, and they were given the assignment to talk to a young lady. So the first Sunday, they said, Hi, we'll call her Jenny. Hi, Jenny, we're just so glad you're here. We're Oli and Olga, and you didn't know us before, but we'd like to become your friends. And Jenny thought, this is weird. <laughs> so she went walking the halls with her friends. The next week she came in, and Oli and Olga met her and said, Hi, Jenny, do you remember us? We're Oli and Olga. We met you last week. We're so glad we got to meet you. We've been thinking about you all week. We could just hardly wait to see you again. We're just so glad to see you this morning. Jenny shook her head went walk in the halls with the other teenagers. The next week they met her, greeted her eagerly. They said, Jenny, we were wondering if you would sit with us in worship. She thought that was a very unusual offer. So she sat with them, and she discovered that they just loved singing the hymns, and they were so fervent in their prayers that she really liked worship. She thought that was so amusing. So the next week she sat with them again. And about three weeks later, they invited over to lunch after worship. And two weeks after that, they invited Jenny to invite her parents to sit with them. And Jenny said, I don't know. My parents, they, they aren't very interested in coming to church. I only go to church because I'm in confirmation class. And they said, oh, but we'd love to meet your parents. Would you tell them we, we're inviting them and we'd just love it if they'd come? And so their parents showed up the next week. And Oli and Olga succeeded. Now, actually, this is a true story. Succeeded in mending the broken relationship between Jenny and her parents. And ever since then, Jenny and her parents are, are constant participants in worship. That pastor changed the congregation by inviting older people to talk with younger people. And the confused millennials became much less confused, and the entire congregation was changed. It's a true story. And I tell it with the pastor's permission because he doesn't want to take the credit. He wants all the credit to go to God, and of course it does, but God worked through him beautifully, don't you think? Yeah. And it was him being very aware of the needs of these confused millennials and these weary skeptics. And their need was for judgment, epiphany, the coming of God in human beings, and the kingdom that's made up of the saints. And they restored community in that congregation like it had never been before. I dare you to try it with the millennials in your congregation. Let's go on. Paul says, in light of this trio, proclaim the gospel. We translate it in most English translations, like the one that I memorized. Um, we translate it, preach the word. But it's much stronger in the Greek. It's proclaim or herald. Um, you know, announce it with great, a, a great, uh, well, the only thing I can think of is one church denomination that has a missionary endeavor called ablaze to announce it with that kind of fervor, ablaze with the gospel, herald the word. And that speaks critically into our age when sermons are getting less and less about God and more and more about human experience and more and more about the daily newspaper, yes? I don't know where I said it, but somewhere I said we only keep half of Karl Barth's dictum. Remember Barth said, preach with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other hand. Most people just preach with the newspaper in many denominations. Probably not in yours. That's not true at all, is it? So proclaim the word. And how much of the word is a great gift? Young people, believe it or not, are very hungry for the, for the Bible. I started a Bible study when I was in campus ministry. 
It started with t five people, and they said, oh, there's just five of us. This is not going to be very good. And I said, just wait. See what God does with it. And these were high school kids. Pretty soon, some of my college students started coming. Pretty soon, it didn't fit in my apartment anymore. I lived in a small apartment, and kids would be sitting all the way down the stairway to the first floor. So we had to move to the university. And the only place on the University of Idaho campus where we could get room was the wrestling room which is an extremely stinky room. <laughs> I mean, I can't say it any genteel way. It was just outrageous. But we got up to 100 people there. And if they would come to that stinky room for Bible study, I guess college students are interested. We just need to introduce them to what a joy scripture is. And in our own churches, to help people discover this is not an old, boring book. This is a book filled with all kinds of adventures. You know, think about some of the adventures in the Bible, like Elijah getting carried away in a fiery chariot. I mean, that's not common sense daily activities. True? There are so many good stories in the scriptures, and we need to recognize them for what they are. And stories are very appealing to young people. That's how they tell their own narratives. So preach the word. Then I love the phrase, be urgent in season and out of season. There's times when they're just not going to hear, but you keep preaching it anyway so that they recognize you're consistent with it. And I have a wonderful story of that. I used to teach literature of the Bible at the university, and I would have my students mark their Bibles that that was their textbook. Because it was a public university, I couldn't say, this is a great word from the Lord. I would just say, mark this text because it's important for you to understand this book of the Bible. I had to teach it as literature. So they, this one student didn't care about the class at all, but he would always mark the passages. He flunked out of my class and of school. And five years later, he came back. And he found me because... My roommate at that time had been too lazy to take my name off the door. And he was visiting his brother who lived next door. And so he asked her where I was living, and she pointed him to where I was living. And he came over to my house, and uh, he called me by my name, and he said, I want you to know that I'm a different person than when you knew me. And I said, why? And he said, because I read that Bible you had us mark up. And it changed my life. And I just want you to know I'm playing my flute to the glory of God now. What a wonderful testimony of when it wasn't urgent. I mean, when it was really urgent on my side, but not urgent on his side. He marked the Bible anyway. And when I said, put a star by this passage, because this one's key, he put those stars. He read those starred verses, and he understood. The gospel converted him. The word and we never know when the Bible is going to convert people like that. Did you see the slave movie about, um, what was it, Anastas? Oh, um, no, not Amadeus. That's the one about Mozart. Yeah, that's the one, Anastas, which is close enough to Anastasis, the word for resurrection. That's why I like it. But it's also why I always mix it up. But in that movie, do you remember that wonderful scene when they're going through that Bible storybook that has pictures in it? Do you remember that scene? Yes. Those of you that saw the movie and how faith came to those people just through looking at that book's pictures. We never know how the gospel is going to touch people. And so we need to be urgent in season and out of season when our people are not interested to preach the gospel anyway and to preach the word with all fervency, because it can change lives. Not only that, not only be urgent in season and out of season, but then reprove, rebuke, exhort. And there's another set of three. And though rebuke is harsh, it's surrounded by reprove, which is a more loving term, and exhort, which is the most loving thing to do. I always say, if you want to say a word of rebuke to somebody, couch it in 99 wonderful words of approval. We need to surround our rebukes with love. But when they're surrounded by love, there's a time when people really need to be rebuked. 
And if kids are in destructive behavior, like they're drinking in ways that cause them to take their own lives in their hands, as well as other lives, when they drive while drinking, we need to rebuke them fiercely. But couch it in love, because this is a person who really wants to be loved. This is a person who's lonely and is turning to alcohol for relief of his loneliness. This is a person who don't, doesn't know what to make of life. And we can be a mentor to a person like that. So this trio of reprove, rebuke, exhort reminds us of the godly way that we want to talk to people. Trinitarianly. And God the Father is not to be known as a wrathful God. God sends his Son, who is the icon, the very image of the Father, and shows that the Father is compassionate. So we can use that for those young people who are confused and say, well, the God of the Old Testament is such a nasty God, and the God of the New Testament seems the opposite. No, we can correct them and show all the ways that God, as portrayed in the First Testament, is the covenant God, the Lord who never breaks a promise. Next, the text goes on to say, with great intimacy of long-suffering and patience in our instruction, so that when we deal with those weary skeptics and confused millennials, that we really have long-suffering. And I stress that word rather than patience, because American, North American patience, excuse me, is such rotten patience. People have patience until the sitcom ends more happily or until the pain pill takes effect in a half an hour. They don't understand the biblical word for endurance. Biblical word for endurance, hupon money, is to remain under. The best person I ever knew for that was my quadriplegic friend, or my friend who had quadriplegia, um, who just died last year. And he was such a good friend. And I used to always talk to him about theology, because he was a captive audience. He was on his dialysis machine. And he couldn't move. And we'd have these wonderful theological discussions. And I went back to him years later and said, Oh, Tim, I'm just so sorry. I used to take advantage of you and tell you all these good things about my own experiences. And here you were tied to a dialysis machine. He said, Oh, no. I enjoyed those conversations because all your good experiences were mine, too, since we're in the Christian community together. Isn't that the greatest of long-suffering? And, to, and that's what young people need nowadays because they come back again and again and again and they always want to have new answers. They always want new insights. They always want a new understanding of God that can really do them for all time. And they want everything to be new because they're afraid of things that are old because they've never learned what a treasure they are. Old has been taught to them to be disappointing. So as we deal with millennials, it takes our introducing them to things that have more lasting power than the ever newness of the millennial generation. And so we have great patience and long suffering. Let's move on to the next verse, which in the, in the text is a great picture of the 21st century. How we Turn to these people who have such itching ears. That we have that great patience and long-suffering with them. We teach them over long periods of time. Because in this generation, which is the fulfillment of the time will come, when people will no longer endure sound doctrine, that's because they don't want to wait long enough to really understand what it means and discover to their great joy that it's sound and it's stable and it's lasting, and it's for them forever. When they haven't got such sound doctrine, because they want their ears tickled, because their ears are turned away from the truth and turned toward myths. Look at how many myths young people believe in. And I'd like to hear from you, since I've never been to Nova Scotia before, what are the myths that young people cling to these days up here? Actually, I should say down here, because you're lower than we are in Washington State. 
Lower on the globe, I didn't mean lower in intellect. <laughs> what are the myths that young people turn to around here? Has Nova Scotia got no myths? Yes. Oh, yes, that's big ones, that there's no consequences. And so they don't take responsibility for the consequences of their actions. That is a really big myth. And that's why we need to mentor them over a long haul so that they can start to see some of the consequences of their actions as they change. Yeah, that's a very important myth all over North America. Thank you so much. Anybody else have an insight into a myth of young people? What? Yes, if it feels good. One of their whole myths is that you can rely on feelings. And that's why I think it's very important that we talk about the objectivity of truth. They believe there is no such thing as objectivity. And that's why it's very important that we don't rely in our testimony solely on feelings. Because when people rely on feelings, those feelings can change. This is another true story that I got from a high school newspaper that someone, one in high school, became a Christian because they were told, that person was told, that I can't remember if it was a he or she, so I'll say he, she. Um, that young person believed a wrong idea about Christianity that would always make you happy. And the first time that person was sad after becoming a Christian, committed suicide. And left a suicide note, I'm sorry, but I can't be happy all the time. Nowhere, brothers and sisters, nowhere in the scriptures does it say you can be happy all the time. And that's one of the reasons I don't like the new, um, the good news Bible. Because it translates the Beatitudes, happy are those. Happy. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be happy. It just says you can rejoice. But it says rejoice always, y'all. I don't know if you say y'all up here, but the plural, I was told by a man from Georgia, the plural of y'all is all y'all. <laughs> so the proper rendition of Philippians 4.4 4 is, be continually joyful in the Lord, always all y'all. And again, I say, keep rejoicing. It's Greek imperatives that are present imperative. So it's keep on rejoicing, not just be rejoicing once and for all. And always it's in the plural. Imperatives like that. So if I'm not particularly feeling joyful, although you, be, you can be joyful when you don't feel happy. Yes. And when you can be joyful, even if you're feeling so down in the dumps, you're so depressed that you can't even think about the joy the rest of the community does. And the rest of the community helps you understand where that joy comes from. Why do we have joy all the time? Because Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. And nothing can change that. Therefore, I know that God accepts me. Amen? Amen. And oh, that's good news to young people. And how important it is that we preach in a way that they get a foretaste of that. So that having that foretaste, they long for its fulfillment. And therefore yearn for the truths of Christianity. So be joyful in the Lord always. It's just important to teach that to those that turn their ears away from the truth. Those that want their ears tickled, you know you can never have enough of tickling. Just like if you've got a persistent itch, you can never get enough of people scratching your back for you. Yeah, have you experienced that? Mm -hmm. I would suppose you would up here. That's why I used that example. Because I figured with as dry as your houses are, because you have to fight the cold dampness outside, you probably have dry skin. Yes? Am I right? Well then, just as you have perpetual itches, so young people have a perpetual thirst for some sort of fulfillment and some sort of answer to their loneliness. So that's why when they turn their ears away from truth and toward myths, we can respond to their having ears needing to be tickled 
we can respond with sound doctrine and deep truths. Because they'll keep turning away. And we need to keep turning toward them. And that's why the need for great intimacy. Let's go to the last verse of our text because I promised to be on time tonight so that you have more time for questions. But you, and here's another, um, oh, I forgot the word. Paraphrastic. Those of you who took Greek, you know what a paraphrastic is and how it's a continuingly, continuingly continue. We don't have that in English. It's when you combine a participle that is a present participle, not an aorist, so you can't just say it's decisive, but it's a present participle, and it's coupled with a present verb like be. So the last verse of our text begins with be being controlled at all times or in the face of all things. I translated it, or the version I used translates it, be sober in all things. But sober in North American talk just means you haven't dipped into the wine vat lately. And that's not what I mean by it. Being controlled. And it's not so much self-controlled as it is our self controlled by God. And when we give up ourself to such an extent that it can be controlled by God, so that if God says go, you go. If God says stay, you stay. If God says hang in there with that teenager you're working with, hang in there. That's the kind of self-control that I'm asking for. A control that I'm ready to go wherever God sends me. Even if it's to Nova Scotia in the ice. <laughs> I just said that so that I could have a public reason to say thank you to all the people who have helped me over ice. You do not know how you have saved my life because I usually slip on ice and I'm very grateful for those of you that have helped me. Thank you. And I want to say that publicly so that you'll all thank the people who have taken care of me while I'm here. It's been immeasurably wonderful. So be being controlled in all things. The next the next phrase is bear hardship. And I know people who turn down ministries because they don't want to bear the hardship. And yet, oftentimes, that's the very door through which God would call us. And sometimes we can even tell our call by which one is harder. True? Has that happened to any of you here? That you discovered your call? Yes. Yes. What a wonderful gift of God, hardship. Because during that hardship, we always grow closer to God, don't we? That's why Christianity is being killed in North America. It's too easy. Life is too easy here. The, the economy has helped. But it's not that I like the economy being so broken. Because there's too many people that are suffering terrible, because, terribly, because they are um, not occupied, that their occupations have been ended, and there's too many people that are jobless. And so I, it's not that I wish for a bad economy, but the one thing about a bad economy is that more people are turning to the Lord. And we should be alert to that for the sake of caring for people. It's a wonderful evangelistic opportunity since the next phrase is, do the work of an evangelist and be doing that work in light of the economic times so that we're always ready to reach out to those who are, are searching for answers in their present time. And when we do that work of an evangelist, that enables us to fulfill our ministry. So I love these four phrases that Paul uses at the end of this text. And then, of course, in the rest of the text, Verses 6 to 8 in this particular passage, he goes on to talk about how he's run his race, how he's completed the course, how he's ready to be taken up because he knows that, that his future lies with God. But we go on to that only um, if I wanted to go on to that, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to manage it in 45 minutes. And I promised, and now I've made it with extra time for asking questions. Um, so that as we think about this last four, be sober in all things, 
be being controlled by the Trinity instead of by our own self-control. And that is such valuable advice to give to young people, especially those that are caught up in, drink, in binge drinking. Because we can have the self-control to stay away from binge drinking when it's the Trinity's control that we're relying on and not our own weak attempts at self-control. And in the opposite way, those of us who serve as pastors or evangelists or preachers or teachers, which includes probably all of you in this room or those of you studying theology, that be being self-controlled by the Holy Spirit also frees us from our frenzy. Because we're not caught up into the world's demand for productivity, but instead we can keep a regular Sabbath. And in keeping a regular Sabbath, bring genuine rest into our life so that we can rest more thoroughly and by resting more thoroughly can serve more effectively. Have you all discovered that with your own practice of Sabbath keeping? Maybe you're still developing the practice, but I encourage you to discover that great joy that be being self-controlled by the Holy Spirit is even richer than any of your possible attempts because we have to acknowledge our weakness and there's just a certain barrier between which we cannot go or we lose it. We lose our self-control. We lose our ability to fulfill our ministry. We lose our ability to do the work of an evangelist because we have lost our own joy in the gospel. And maybe that's because we haven't borne enough hardship. Maybe it's because we have not entered into the plight of the people that we serve and have not really borne the brunt of their concerns. Now I hope those reproofs were couched in enough exhortations and I hope that you know my love is behind it otherwise I would not say such things. But many times we miss out on the blessings of God simply because we're not willing to surrender. We're not willing to give totally into God and recognize the immensity of his blessings through us or in spite of us. I turn now to your questions so that we can have enough time that I don't send you home later because I heard the weather is going to turn. Comments, questions, rebukes, reactions, whatever. Well, we'll be prepared for some questions. Please come to the microphones. There's one there and one over here. I see that hand, brother. Would you make your way to the microphone? It's me again, Marva, Glenn. Um, I'm sorry, I missed your name when you said Glenn. it. Glenn. Oh, Glenn, yes. hi. <laughs> uh, first night, you used one of my technical terms for the reading of scripture, which is the blah, blah, blah method. Um, could you say something about the blah, blah, blah method of preaching? Because there are those who want to be biblically centered, but they're so boring when they do it that people don't want to hear it. They want their ears tickled. How do you see enticing people to hear solid teaching, but teaching that's not going to put them to sleep? Mm. Could you comment on that, your perspective on that? I have a friend um, who's a pastor in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, he and I were co-speakers at Regent one time, and he said, you should never preach a sermon that hasn't converted you first. Mm -hmm. And he said, he used to live in Montana. That's when I first met him. And in Montana, he would walk the trout streams. And I said, what on earth do you do in Cincinnati? He says, I walk the malls because that's where my people are. And I might run into them. But I walk the malls until I'm sure that a text is going to convert me. And then I go back to my study. And he said sometimes he walked the trout streams day after day until he was sure what to preach on Sunday. That means you have to start early in the week. And you know, one 
One way that I have found to be converted by the scripture on which I'm preaching is by memorizing it. And I cannot recommend the practice more. Not, not to put any of you under undue pressure if you can't memorize. That's, that's fine. But study it as if you were trying to memorize it. Spend that much time just with the text. Um, my preaching professor urged me to spend at least an hour with the text and no commentaries. Mm -hmm. Just the text. And read it over and over and over until you see something unusual. And I was trying that method once. When I was talk, did I tell you this about the Emmaus story? Okay, I was studying the text of the Emmaus walk. And all of a sudden, as I was just looking at the text, as the professor had advised, I got to the, when Cleopas asked Jesus, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And um, Jesus says to them, what things? And then the English says, clearly, they replied. I thought that was interesting because it was only Cleopas talking and I'd heard the theory that the other person was Cleopas's wife. That's why she stays unnamed. Um, I won't comment on that right now. <laughs> or ever. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, I looked it up in the Greek and in the Greek it's they replied. And that made me really curious. And I read the text more and more and more and I suddenly saw that in the text there's two voices. There's kind of a cynical voice and there's kind of a wishful voice. So the cynical voice says, the words about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in word and deed, before God and all the people. And how we thought, you know, there's this other answer. And the cynical voice says, yes, well, let me think of my favorite one. The wishful voice says, and the women came back and said that they went to the tomb and they saw a vision there that told them that Jesus was alive. And the other voice says, yes, but when the men went. <laughs> Sorry, that's not in the text. <laughs> the cynical voice says, yes, but when they went. But it was the men. It was the disciples. And the women had come back with this wishful thinking. And... Um, I found that as I interpret the text that way, I'm sorry I couldn't do all of it, but I, I'm a little bit unbalanced tonight. Um, as, the, uh, as people hear that text, they identify with one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And that all came out just because I was spending an hour with this text and saw the day. And it led to a whole different understanding of what that text is doing when it goes back and forth like that. And it, it presents two interpretations whether Jesus really rose from the dead. One, to be cynical and say he couldn't have. Nobody's ever done that before. And the other, wishful thinking, wanting it to be true but not yet having heard that it really is true. You know, and we discover that in our congregation there are a whole bunch of wishful thinkers and a whole bunch of cynics. And they respond to a sermon that addresses those kinds of concerns about the Emmaus story. Think about that and try preaching it. You won't be bored. I can promise you that. So in studying the scriptures, I think we get more excited about the text if we do the right kind of study. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we study not just relying on commentaries, especially if our commentaries are skewed, but in re relying on our own investigations, our own searching into things that puzzle us when we read the text, our own searching into what God is really saying to us. You know, when, when I was thinking about this text canonically, that's why I could say, because Paul says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, that, that really shows us what God is wanting from preachers. I guess I didn't explain that enough. I sort of took a shortcut. So I was afraid I'd go overtime, and so I took a shortcut on a lot of this stuff. That's why I'm hoping you'll ask questions about the text, because I took sh too many shortcuts and got done early. But, but in, in doing that kind of preparatory work, it changes our attitude about our preaching. But if we just prepare it for other people, you know, we're giving them yesterday's manna. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Yes, thank you very much, Glenn. Someone is coming here. 
Hello, Dr. Don. It's Cheryl Ann. Yay. Yes. You were talking about bearing hardship. How do we prepare the church to bear hardship, mm. to suffer, so that others might come into the kingdom? That's really important. That is an excellent question. I think one way is by modeling our own bearing of hardship and even being willing to share it with the congregation, to say from the pulpit, I'm having a tough struggle with this dimension of what's going on right now, and I hope you'll share that struggle with me and, and bear me up in prayer, and if you have any insights, come and tell me. Because mm -hmm. you know, it might be a hardship in your family, for example, and the congregation would want to pray for you, of course, and might have some insights. Um, another way is by teaching a class on the Martyr's Mirror. Um, that's a book by the Mennonites about their early history, how their church was born out of struggling. Or I was thinking Harriet Tubman mm -hmm. have her biography, which, which Cheryl Ann recommended to us the other morning at the prayer breakfast, or which, was it the prayer breakfast? Yeah, it was the prayer yes, breakfast. Was. Yes. I, this week's been so wonderful. I get all the stuff mixed up. Which, when she shared that, that immediately went on my reading list because when you see the hardship of others and how look what she did mm -hmm. um, came through that, that God used that hardship so magnificently, we start to help people have a more favorable attitude about hardship, that it isn't just something to be rejected, as our culture always teaches we are so cult culturally imbued with the idea you get rid of suffering as fast as you can, don't want anything to do with it. Whereas in the church, we recognize that we were born out of suffering. Mm. Whether in our own personal life, definitely in the church. You know, persecution was right away. Immediately they wanted to find the followers of Jesus and put them to death too. Mm -hmm. And when the church got sloppy was in the Constantinian fall. Some of us call it the fall. <laughs> because when the Christian church became aligned with the public government, it started to rest in its laurels. And it lost its edge because it no longer was being persecuted. That's why Christianity is thriving in nations that are persecuted and not in North America. So I, th I believe we should tell children stories of early Christian persecution or tell them stories of great saints who suffered greatly, and, and recognize that Jesus always us, in, accompanies us in our hardship so we don't have to be afraid of it. The, the worst thing about hardship is usually our fear about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if we can diffuse that fear by recognizing God has promised to be with, it, with us in it, and also that Jesus himself underwent the worst, not, not just the physical crucifixion. There are many martyrs who've gone through more physical suffering than Jesus. But none have gone through the spiritual suffering of bearing the sins of the world. All of our sins must be terrible to bear. I know how guilty I feel with one sin. But all the sins of the world and for Jesus to bear all that for our sake, I can't even begin to comprehend it. Can you? Thank you for modeling it for us. Mm. We've been blessed. Thank you. Forgive when my model fails, mm -hmm. which it does often. Thanks, Cheryl Ann, for that question. Hi, Dr. Don. It's Tim Archibald. I do want to thank you for your writing and how it, it nourishes us, especially your book on Sabbath. I found that really a helpful one. So thank you so much, Keeping oh. the Sabbath Holy. Thank you. I was hoping that I you could say I appreciate your some, encouragement. I was hoping that you could say something about the difference between teaching and proclamation and preaching. Yes, in, in teaching, we, um, I want to say, make more, can make more points. Um, in teaching, we explicate things more. In teaching, we give a larger narrative and are able to do little sidetracks that help people learn something more. Um, teaching is more expository. 
Um, I don't say that preaching is not expository, but teaching is more expository and includes more sidelights, various things. And it's a different gift from preaching. Preaching, in fact, I run into the problem that too easily I teach when I'm supposed to be preaching. Preaching is much more of proclaiming the good news so that everybody can lap it up. But as I'm so Lutheran trained, I have to give a little bit of law too. So that the people get hungry and realize they need the gospel. But preaching is much more proclaiming the greatness of God. Whereas teaching can help us see some of the tangents that come off of what we see about God and help us recognize the way God works through such and such or the way God uses this and that and so forth and so forth. So on this one, I, I can point to the trio of terms and talk about the Trinity and realize that this is a, a divine way of noting something that we should note and recognize the proportions in that trio. But I wouldn't do that in a sermon because that just takes us away from the great good news about it. I'm thinking that in a sermon, uh, we, we do teach. And if you could say something about within the sermon, the difference yeah. between our, our teaching and our proclamation and how we keep God at, at the center of our preaching, rather than even just, just simply preaching the text or the story, but, but that we're able to proclaim God as being, um, you know, part of what's uh, God at work. Yeah, um, I don't know how to explicate it very well because I'm not a preaching professor or a teaching professor, and so I don't say it as well as those who have been trained to um, elucidate that. Um, so I beg your pardon that I'm weak in answering that question. Um, we, as I understand preaching, preaching is proclaiming the gospel in such a way that those who almost have um, set themselves off from it, who have hardened their hearts against it, become interested again and realize the goodness of what they're living so that they can go out into the world with the zest of a new believer. So in the process of that, of course we do teaching because we, we have to exp explain to people something that they might not understand. Like um, I heard a wonderful sermon that was done geographically. And it was done geographically by showing how far Jesus walked in some of his missions and what, what he did when he was interrupted in his walk. It was a wonderful sermon, but the geography had to be explained because most people don't have a map of the Holy Land in their heads. So there was that teaching about the geography of the Holy Land. It happened to be a professor who works on teaching geography in the, in the scriptures. Um, but she purposely demonstrated how that teaching brought the gospel more to bear and made it more lively. Thank you. So is that a good enough example? Yeah. No, that was good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thank you for asking the question. Hi, my name is Bruce, and thank you for the opportunity of asking a question. I had made notes, and uh, I have one word, which is stories. And you just briefly touched on Bible stories. And uh, I just wondered if you had heard anything about, you had mentioned that young people are gravitating towards story. And um, if you had heard anything about the Bible storying movement mm -hmm. and what the, in preaching we deal mostly with conceptual things. We expound on a passage of scripture. We might take an entire half hour sermon to deal with a particular phrase from the Bible. But the Bible story movement seems to be moving more towards giving a story from the Bible. And then it, I've heard that there's some um, interesting things happening with that. I was just wondering if you were, uh, have heard anything about how storying is gripping the church. Um, yes. Um, in fact, I participated with some people in a, a storying workshop just so I could find out more about it. And unfortunately, the sermons I heard at that workshop, it might have been a very, not very good workshop, but um, the, the stories that I heard never proclaimed the gospel. They, they never got around to the good news. 
And I thought that was a huge failure on the part of the storytellers. And I have a little problem with the way most people think about story in our culture. Because a lot of people think about stories on television and so they think about them in terms of, well, they could be myths. They could be fiction stories. Um, and a lot of people really gravitate toward fiction stories. And I don't want to use story uh, in that way. Um, when I talk with young people and I ask about their story, that's because other young people don't know it from them. Their peers don't know what's behind their behaviors. And I ask for some of their background in order that I can understand some of their behaviors. Um, so I prefer to call it the narrative theology movement. And to do narrative theology is to do the narratives that are in scripture, but to tell them with insight that points to the grace of God, mm -hmm. that points to the good news of the gospel. And, and if, if a story is going to wind up just showing the law, capital L, then I wouldn't want to use that story in, in scripture. I would want to add a narrative to it that winds it up with gospel because we don't want to have a sermon without gospel. I guess I was just thinking about when I grew up, um, I knew the Bible story, so I had this sort of library of stories. I didn't learn right away about the gospel, but I knew the story of Daniel and the lion's den, and I knew you know, this story and that story, and then somehow or other it forms this larger story, mm -hmm. which is the narrative that you're speaking about. So I guess the, it, it's this ongoing narrative which, uh, which these smaller stories, everything from book of Genesis to Daniel to Ezekiel and so on, form this larger story. And I guess that's what I was thinking about there. Yeah, stay there because I want to add one thing. That's why I was putting down my crutch. I wanted to be more free. Um, when we talk about narratives, of course, there's the wonderful meta-narrative. You know what I mean by meta-narrative? The story that's above all the meta-narrative covers them all. Now, um, I come from the United States, and the United States has a terrible meta-narrative. You know, people like to say, oh, the great American story, American. The United States story is that um, the pilgrims came to the United States, and they were so brave, and uh, the pioneers were so brave when they crossed the wilderness, and, and um, you know, all this kind of stuff, and you never hear the bad parts of the story. Well, the bad parts the slaves know, the bad parts the wives know, the bad parts the children know, you know, and so the meta-narrative of the United States, um, and I must say, I'm really <coughs> grateful that President Obama was elected because he's trying to change the meta-narrative more toward justice and peace. But the politics of the country is so bad that the politics are making that next to impossible, and now he's getting critiqued all the time. But I had real visions of what a change it could be because he was wanting to work more for justice and peace than had been the story of the United States. So its meta-narrative is not a good meta-narrative. And people want to say that meta-narratives are always, are always oppressive because of the French philosophers of the postmodern movement. That all meta-narratives are, are oppressive. But the meta-narrative of Christianity is not especially because it's a meta-narrative that's rooted in slavery. It's a meta-narrative that shows various viewpoints. So we have chronicles that is the viewpoint of the kings as opposed to kings, I'm sorry, chronicles that's the view of the priests as opposed to kings that's opposed to the kings as opposed to First and Second Samuel that's the view of the prophets. So it includes various viewpoints right there in the Bible. And what do you do with the fact that Ecclesiastes is there along with Proverbs. They say the opposite, but they can be in the same book because the meta narrative of God is non oppressive. In fact, it's so non oppressive it includes crucified Savior. And out of that crucifixion bore the oppression for all of us for the sake of us to know the kingdom of God. So what we have in Christianity is a meta narrative that trounces all other national meta narratives or any other kinds of meta-narratives you want to posit and shows that God is a gracious God over the entire meta-narrative and our meta-narrative is eternal and therefore it, it goes beyond meta-narratives that are stuck with various ages. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went at no, length on that. But I thought you might get preaching. Oh.